I wrote this booklet here. It's called Modern Science and Philosophy Destroys Christian Theology, the first edition here. And with me today is uh, somebody I'm going to talk to about this booklet. His name is Kurt Durheim. Welcome to our discussion, Kurt. Thank you. Kurt is a um, amateur comedian. And also, what's interesting about you, Kurt, is that you're an agnostic, a Christian agnostic. I know a lot of agnostics who um, are like atheist agnostics, and they just assume that's the way all agnostics are. So I think it's interesting that you're a Christian agnostic. Uh, do you want to explain a little bit more what a Christian agnostic is for somebody who's never heard of such a thing? Yeah, okay. Well, there are other Christian agnostics. I've uh, Googled the name, and, and there are a few other ones, and I have it... Uh, look too much at, at exactly what they believe, but what from what I have read, it's, it's very similar to me. And, uh, and I used to be a regular agnostic, uh, atheist, slash atheist, um, but I felt, you know, I was raised as a Christian, and I went back into, a I went into atheism during a deconversion process, and then I, I couldn't uh, help but uh, keep being drawn back to it. Uh, mainly a lot of the Christian music was really inspiring for me, and a lot of the discussions about ethics and the meaning of life and all that and also the the friendships of I, I've had with uh, people in church and other Christians so uh, so I still like uh, I still love Christian music there's a lot of uh, I love uh, discussing these topics uh, uh, how it applies to our lives and everything so I can't just dismiss it and because we don't know everything in the, in the world so I can't uh, uh, you know if I uh, and, and and also have to. Uh, everybody lives their life one way or the other, even without uh, complete uh, knowledge and information. So we have to make a jump of leap somewhere. So I, I, uh, I try to stay on the on the I guess maybe the safe side, and say uh, okay, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and and, and uh, try to accept Christianity as much as possible. But I also have a lot of intellectual doubts. Uh, about it, so I don't uh, necessarily hold to everything that most Christians believe in. And, uh, Orthodox Christians, I have a lot of issues with them and what they believe. So, uh, just mainly, I just, uh, I just felt it uh, continuing to uh, be a, a positive force in my life. That's why I call myself a Christian agnostic. Okay, and I'm a former Christian myself. I used to do an internet ministry, and you know. Um, I left Christianity, I became an atheist, but I didn't want to leave it willingly. I, you know, if there was one thread that I could hold on to, I would have held on to it. So for me, I no longer yeah. saw a thread. Yeah. Uh, can you give a, why don't you explain a little bit about how you first found out about me? Because that's kind of interesting, just a few seconds. Oh yeah, I was, uh, um, in fact, I was a, an atheist, or a lot closer to atheism at the time when I found out about you, and I was, uh, I think I've told you before, uh, some of the some of the uh, Christians uh, or apologists in Christianity that were really uh, rubbing me the wrong way, and I had a bad impression of uh, of them, and, and mainly their tactics of of uh, perhaps maybe abusing their authority and uh, com complain. Uh, uh, claiming uh, absolute knowledge and all that. And Hank Handograph was one of those guys. And uh, I was doing some research on him. That's the Bible About answer the, man. Yeah, the Bible answer man. And he had, uh, he was on the top of the, or close to uh, one of the, I think, top five main Christian apologists who were way up on the top there of the uh, salaries. I think uh, John Haggett was way, way up there. And then uh, there was a few other ones that were right. Still pretty, pretty hefty salaries, about a half a million to you know, something around that area. So uh, I, I stumbled onto a website that you had. I think it was um, Good News or something like that. Good News. Yeah, free good news. Yeah. Free good news. Okay. And I found a lot of the, the stuff on there, and I, I really uh, found it helpful. So, uh, and, I, and I called you up uh, on a few things uh, about that, and we talked a little. And I remember you were a Christian, and um, I didn't really say. I had a lot of disagreements about Christianity. I didn't bring them up to you because I didn't know if, because uh, I wanted to continue talking to you. I don't know, maybe if I, if I raised some doubts, maybe you thought I was a, a heretic and wouldn't talk to me anymore. So I, I kind of held that to myself a little bit. Mm -hmm. But I was really surprised that about two years ago I found out that you were an atheist. But. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I used to have an atheist or a Christian ministry, and I was a Christian, born again Christian. 
and uh, that's how we first met. And so now that I came up with this booklet, um, you had some interest in talking about this. So again, this is the booklet right here, and we're going to talk about um, three three categories here, and each one's about ten minutes. The first category is just your uh, general comments about this. We can talk about that uh, about the booklet. The second category is going to be um, I'm going to I'm going to talk about how I left Christianity and see what you think about that since you're an agnostic and maybe you're on the fence. You know, what's 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 keeping you from jump jumping? You know. Oh, okay. um, and then the third thing is. Um, we could talk about why you might have some objections, like why would why would a person want to be an atheist? Uh, you know, is that too much of a jump? So first, let's start with um, your comments on the booklet. Yeah, I read through it. I, I really didn't have any, uh, too many. <laughs> I didn't have too many objections. I, uh, there's nothing really significant that stood out that I I had a problem with. I I'm uh, perfectly fine with uh, 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 theistic evolution. And uh, just about everything that goes along with that, and I don't agree with a lot of the traditional responses that Christians have for the problem of evil and free will and all that. So uh, I don't have any problem with that. I just uh, I don't think that those are necessarily part of uh, being a Christian. Uh, that a lot of Christians seem to think that are important. Okay. So what what would uh, do you have any objections or? So Not it really sounds like no. Uh, yours, uh, you know, I, I, I don't really have a problem with a lot of uh, what you said in there, you know, and a lot of Christians don't either. Uh, they're not really, they don't get a whole lot of press in the uh, conservative evangelical world because they're considered maybe uh, liberal or, or uh, you know, kind of uh, show a heretical viewpoint. Uh, they don't stand to the traditional doctrine of Christianity, but. Uh, there are they are out there like Francis Collins. Uh, he was uh, he's a he's a, uh, a theistic evolutionist. And I was just going to his website here when I was before I was got on your show, here, and I was going to read a few things, but I didn't wasn't able to really get any information off there because uh, as, uh, we were having some computer difficulties here. But um, he has some really okay. interesting topics and questions about uh, his viewpoint and. Uh, and I know a lot of Christians don't accept it, but I uh, I trust him more than the other ones because his his salary isn't tied into holding up a particular doctrine as a Christian. Well, Francis Collins is a brilliant guy too. He's got like a PhD, and I can't remember what it was. Well, obviously uh, biology, but I think yeah. uh, before that he was in math, and he he got a medical degree, I believe, also is like yeah. pretty incredible. Okay, so overall, it sounds like you don't really have a lot of. Uh, complaints about my booklet is kind of interesting because the, the previous webcast I did was with my old seminary professor and he just said hey there's there's overstatements galore in there you know oh, yeah. and I said well it depends on who you talk to because you know some of the, the most uh, probably everything in there I wrote most atheists would say like well duh you know it's like so like <laughs> my seminary professor you know he doesn't really want to grant uh, evolution you know so okay so um, let's so if there's nothing major to discuss there, do you want to go on to the second part then? Okay. Uh, well, maybe we can find something to okay. discuss afterwards, but what's the second part then? So the second part is I'll uh, basically just walk through what my booklet said about why I left the faith and see what comments you have on that. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, I want to say there's two there's two scientific things that led me out, and then... and then there's a philosophical thing for people who want to stay after that, okay? So the two... The two science things are number one, biology and evolution, mm -hmm. because in the gospel, um, you know, a lot of Christians, especially liberal Christians, they'll just say like, "Oh, well, you know, believe in Jesus," and it's like, "Why?" And well, because he died on your sins. Why? And if you if you go to a liberal Christian, they don't have a lot of reasons for these whys. But if you go to a fundamentalist Christian or an evangelical Christian, like I was, the people who really want to preach uh, an evangelical gospel, they'll say it all started with Adam and Eve because that's where sin came from. Um, so basically if there's no Adam and Eve, then it's like, well, there's no way to explain how sin came in the world. And Jesus is supposed to, he's actually in the Bible called the second Adam. He came to undo the sin of the first Adam. So if there was no first Adam, there's no need for a second Adam. So that's the that's why that's the that's why a lot of evangelicals oppose evolution on theological theological grounds because it undermines the whole underpinning there of the gospel. So what do you think yeah. about that? Okay, I think uh, I think they can reconciled. 
uh, if you take the Adam and Eve uh, non-literally, uh, maybe, yeah, they, they evolved and they were the first humans uh, people after the after their ancestors who didn't have the what they call the the uh, breath of life uh, that separates us from the animals. You know, just that distinction there that we have the intelligence that they don't have. Well, the also, thing is, the, but but here's the thing: there is no such thing with evolution. There's no such thing as a first human it, because. What that implies, if you say there's a first human, it implies that there's a human that was born from a non-human. And that's not the okay. way evolution works. See, evolution yeah, works right. in a population over time. So there's, yeah, no right. such thing, there's no such thing as a first human. Okay, that's what I mean. Not necessarily that they were just uh, somebody popped out of the uh, uh, of their ancestor's uh, womb and then that's, that was the first human. Yeah, they, at some point, there was, the, uh, there was a distinction between them and the animals, and I think that's... Uh, just what they refer, to, what should be referred to as Adam and Eve, that race of people who who became uh, the human, the their, uh, progen uh, the, the progen uh, the progeny of the uh, uh, human race, and that's that's what refers to as uh, Adam and Eve, I believe. And well, that's so, what I'm that's what I'm saying is there would with evolution, biological evolution, there is no mm -hmm. distinctive change generation from generation. The the sons and daughters are indistinguishable from their parents. And this is also going on within a population of thousands. Mm -hmm. So there is no distinction. I mean, now we have distinctions because of all the gaps. For example, tigers have a distinctive, you know, sharp claws and big teeth, you know, and we have a distinction of a, you know, sharp mind, you know, a, I mean, a more intelligent yeah. mind because of the complexity. But within every generation, there's no discernible difference. Like like we see now, or, we just okay, right? Yeah, there's not a discernible difference between everyone, right? But at some point, if uh, um, if you if you, uh, if you look at the uh, line from the the origins of the of, uh, of life in general to human beings, it's a long, long line. But um, but if you just take right now, just for example, the next closest. Um, cousin or whatever you want to call it that we have, it's uh, some some sort of an ape species, or maybe somebody living on an island that uh, that, that isn't quite as uh, fine and uh, well, and, and smart as we are. But there, but, well, but so, yeah. distinction. If you lined if you lined everybody else, every animal in the world, uh, along with human beings. I think that is where you'd probably be able to draw the distinction there. You'd have that, that monkey on the end there, and then you'd have a person. Even though they, that's not really how it happened, in our, uh, in the human lifespan, even spanning back 3,500, 3, 4,000 years ago when civilization started to begin, that was still, I think, probably a, a good um, indication that humans could make uh, that separated them from the animals. In any way, it doesn't have to be perfect. I'm not, there was uh, uh, what they call, what they call the, the people, that the race that was uh, perhaps before us, they weren't 100% uh, human and they weren't quite all the way. Uh, yeah, well like, well, for example, well, we would uh, prefer as an ape. Well, like the Neanderthal. The well, well, even the Neanderthal. Um, There's some speculation in the scientific uh, w within scientists of whether we there was some mixing or not. And uh, the latest I've heard is there was like maybe uh, there was some mixing, okay. so they think there was some interbreeding. But even they are considered our cousins. And uh, Denisovans is another one. Denisovans is uh, Asian uh, hominids, and um, mm. Mm. Neanderthal was in uh, Europe. Um, but you know, even all but all humans today, even if they're in some lost tribe, un, untouched, mm -hmm. all humans today are there's like not a, yeah, there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, so anyway, uh, there's not really a lot of things that uh, set apart humans from other animals. For example, um, we all think uh, we, like you know, I mean, a lot of we're not the only animals that make tools. We're not the only ones that. Uh, do art, for example, if you consider dancing art, trying to impress a maid or something. Mm -hmm. 
and you know you can see some of them goofing around. So it's not the only yeah. ones. We're not the only ones that have fun. So um, you know sometimes when you ask people what's really unique about humans, um, the only thing that I think I've ever heard is like, oh well, they worship God. Well, that's that's just because our brains are complex enough to you know create all that fantasy story behind it, but. Uh -huh. So anyway, uh, yeah. just to back up, there's I'm saying there's two scientific reasons. So the first one is evolution, which says there's no Adam and Eve, and then um, I'm, so I'm not sure if you're with me there or not. I mean, you 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 might say like, well, you can still believe in an Adam, a literal Adam and Eve, a, mm -hmm. a literal. I mean, bottom line, was there literal first humans or not? Yeah, I don't know exactly where the transition process, uh, where, where you where you draw that line at. You'd have to go back a long ways, uh, but I think just from from the uh, from the time where human beings have been able to use their brain to worship God and all that, that's when they decided to, that there was some, some some sort of a significant difference between human beings and animals, right? And I think there's more of a difference than you you think there are. All you have to do is look outside and look at the. Uh, look at the computer that we're using right here. I don't think there's any animals that even come close to uh, using any or making any tools that even come close to anything. They're just basically, you know, really rough like caveman type of tools. Even even if that, well, you, know, you have your dog at home. He don't make any paintings or he doesn't read philosophy books. And uh, well, yeah, I mean that's just know, the there's, there's that's a, just the complexity of our brain. But let, let me tell you right. that. Uh, but that okay, and the complexity of the brain is what separates us from. The, our predecessors who didn't have that, and I think that's where, where the religious people probably refer to Adam and Eve as the first humans who were able to use their brains in that way, and and made a they were quite distinct from the other animals. And though it might not be perfect, but um, I, I think that's probably, and it doesn't matter to me because I don't. It matters to the Christians who think that the Bible is absolutely inerrant because, uh, in order to keep everything. Uh, from contradicting each other in, in order to be able to uh, uh, use their uh, power to uh, say that the Bible is inerrant and uh, the leaders that, that use that, they have to have everything fit together perfectly. But for me, it doesn't it doesn't bother me. And for a lot of other Christians, it doesn't either. I don't think for Francis Collins, it doesn't. And um, But for the ones who really like to control others through religion and have to have all the right answers about life and it says, they say it's right here in the Bible, it's a problem for them. But it's not It's not if you don't, if you're not really so, so concerned about not everything in the Bible is absolutely uh, true or false. Okay, well, like, for example, the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church is the largest uh, Christian denomination by far. And, you know, what they say is that, you know, at some time, you know, maybe evolution is true, but at some time uh, uh, humans were given a soul by God. And they think that all humans today descended from this Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Well, scientifically, that's nonsense. Scientifically, we did not all descend from one man and one woman. And so... That's what I mean. I, so, bottom line again, literally, was there a first human? And I would say, with evolution, there was no first human. That's a very simple question. Was there a first human or not? Was there a first male? I would say, of course not. So, well, it's, I guess, I guess it's at the point where you know, like, I don't know if you've ever heard the philosophical problem of uh, what is a heap, like a heap of sand. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could right, say right. what, uh, like a pile of like ten thousand sand pieces. Exactly. Sand. That's like heat. Sure, sure. You know, it looks it looks big. Okay, what about five hundred piece? Five thousand. Well, that's still a small heap. Okay, what about uh, four thousand? Okay, three thousand, maybe not. How about three thousand uh, one hundred and eleven? Well, okay, that's a heap. So, so the distinction is really. You know, you can just take away one piece of sand and say, okay, well, this is a heap, but this is it's too small now. It's not a heap anymore. But, but Kurt, and that's I my, think that's probably but, the same way it is with humans. But see, that's my point. That's exactly. We, we, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where we would draw it. I don't know where we would draw that line about. Maybe we're still evolving, and maybe you could say 100 years ago. Uh, maybe the 100 years ago was the first human based upon what criteria you, you want to use for de defining a human being and what they are. No, Kurt, this is my this is my exact point that with emergence when it when humans evolved over time and within a population it's exactly as the question of you said like what is a heap or you can say what is a bald man because you know is one hair a bald man or whatever. <laughs> so when when you have a, gra a gradual gradient 
there is no such thing as a first one, and it's arbitrary where you'd put it. So, right. so people who believe that would say, of course there is no first man because it man emerged. And okay. if you say there's a first man somewhere, it's just arbitrary. Then right. it's not it's not literally true. There is no first man. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, yeah. Everybody could argue about that for a long period of time, and, and uh, so and, uh, but we agree uh, that. So we agree that there is no literal first human, and wherever you draw the line, it would be uh, arbitrary. Yeah. Right. Okay, are, are so you, okay, it's been a long time since I looked into this. Are you familiar with the mitochondrial leaf? Yeah. Uh, yep. Okay. What? Could you just tell me what you know about yep. that really quick? Sure. Okay. Mitochondrial Eve is the is the last common ancestor for all women. Okay. This has nothing about guys. It's saying all the women alive today descended from her, and when you look at her. She would have had other women at that time, but their uh, lineages, their descendants, all died off. So you go back to where all. So she's the she's the last common denominator between all women alive today. And then the Y chromosomal atom is the same thing, but just for guys only. Um, and so, again, even they did not live at the same time. But even if they did live at the same time, it's crazy to think like there are these two people. And all the people today just descended from them. I mean, uh, you know, they would have had brothers and sisters and everything. All, I mean, all there would have been thousands and thousands of people around. So, well, it's possible. I suppose they could have been segregated to a certain area and uh, just uh, populated off of that air, uh, family well, okay. there. And, 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 uh, and well, uh, well, let me tell you we one more. From. Well, let me tell you one more thing about this mitochondrial leave. I, okay. I'm not sure. I can't remember if I had this in my book or not. I think I might, but I wish I did if I didn't. I, don't, I guess I missed it. But, for example, let's say, um, let's say I have six sisters, and let's say all of my sisters went to the moon uh, to check out a moon colony there. Okay. And then on Earth, all of humanity was destroyed in a nuclear war. Okay? Now, if you look at my sisters and say, who is mitochondrial Eve for my sisters? Okay. It would be my mom, because she's the last common ancestor of all women. So you can see, obviously, my mom is not the first woman. So that that just illustrates how the last common ancestor is not has no relationship to being human or not. Okay. Yeah, and again, I, I like I say, this isn't uh, my area. I don't, it, I've dropped this area a long time ago. It does because it doesn't bother me anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I need to keep up with it just just for. Uh, uh, informational reasons, but it's not a yeah. big deal for me. And I don't think, uh, you know, Francis Collins, he's a Christian and he accepts theistic evolution. So I guess the best thing to do would probably go to his site and read some of his uh, uh, stuff on it. So he's going to give right. you a lot better information about that than I am. And I didn't have a chance to get to it. Otherwise, I wish I would have. But, so, well, see, um, now what I did is, uh, as a Christian, I tried to, after accepting evolution, I tried to integrate it into theology. And I look mm -hmm. at people like Francis Collins, and he doesn't really offer any solutions. He just says, like, well, I'm a scientist, and I leave that to the theologians. That's their job. Um, and as far as I can tell, they, they don't have any way of doing it. So a lot of times they just say, well, bottom line, hey, you know, wait till we get to heaven, and uh, yeah, right. we'll ask God. So that's that's where they leave yeah. it. And it's like, no, that's not good enough for me. To me, I think there's logical consequences here. Let's just accept it. Let's the only reason mm -hmm. for not accepting is you're afraid of the conclusion. That's, okay, that's but, my opinion. Okay, okay. The, the, another thing about that, and this is where I probably don't have a problem with it like you do, I don't think that necessarily the interpretation, the traditional interpretation of the Bible about the first Adam and Eve sin, and that's why Jesus had to come and save us, is necessarily the right um, interpretation. That's what, uh, traditionally, that's what the Christians have believed. But that doesn't necessarily make it true, but that doesn't also, that also doesn't negate the fact that there might be a God. Um, you know, Jewish people believe in God, and they have no uh, uh, dog in the fight on this one at all, because they believe in totally, uh, you know, they believe essentially in the same God. They believe in faith. They believe uh, there's, you know, they have a lot of diverse uh, beliefs within Judaism as well, but, but they still believe in a God. And they don't have, they don't have to believe in all this stuff about Christianity either. So so the so whether or not you believe in a God or not is is, is totally you know irrelevant in that first point. But uh, I think a Jewish person probably would have been uh, maybe be easier for you to uh, be uh, to convert to. Maybe maybe that'll be easier for you to swallow. But uh, you know for Christians, yeah. I mean there's uh, I mean that's why 
I have a lot of problems with Christianity because there's so many things that don't make any sense. This is one of them, but it's not, it's not a, an important thing to me, so I don't really, uh, I don't let it bother me. And, you know, if you bring it up at church or a Christian group, you know, they'll probably throw you out for it, but um, you know, that's one of their big time dog, dog doctrines, you know, so, you know, if you well, well, take one of their doctrines, they're going to throw you out and, <laughs> you know, say, don't come back here. But Well, let's, let's look at it this way. I mean, if, if you're a Christian... I think what that means is you say, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Why did okay. Jesus die on the cross for your sins? Why didn't he just say, like, hey, everybody, I'm sorry? Why, well, why, where'd the system come from? Yeah, I mean, that's, I don't believe it. I don't agree with that either. I, I think that uh, that's what um, uh, traditional Christianity at the hands of uh, some powerful priests and elders uh, formed uh, to keep, uh, you know, I mean, I don't think it was their, their intention at first, but eventually it became just a, a display of power. They had to keep, they had to unify the kingdom back in the in the early centuries of uh, Christianity, and uh, they had to come up with some some reasons to unify everybody, and and they used uh, power to do that. And you know, it just became a long, continual process along the way. From from that period of time, it's been the the religious leaders are the ones calling the shots. So, you know, back all the way, if you go back to, you know, what Mormons believe, they believe that, they don't believe a lot of that stuff either, but uh, they, 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 they think they're uh, uh, restoring Christianity to what it was in the, what, the, what it was, was originally meant to be back in the first century, even though they have some added stuff like the Book of Mormon. But, uh, you know, you can, when you say, you, I'm not going to be a Christian, you're, you're accepting what these big-time Christian leaders are telling you what a Christian is. You can still be a Christian and, and dismiss a lot of what they believe. You don't have okay, to. Okay, well, let me, ask you, let me ask you this. Do you believe that uh, Jesus rose from the grave? Not really. Um, eh, it doesn't really bother me if he, if he didn't or not did. I don't think I have a fallback position that he didn't, mm. and I'm pretty sure that he didn't. I think it might have been like, uh, um, uh, you know, like Paul, if, if what he had was a, a real vision, or if he would just had a near-death experience, which I think it probably was, that's probably what what uh, what caused that uh, belief in the resurrected Jesus was. Uh, okay. okay, Jesus was in the grave, but then you die. Like if you have a dream tonight, and uh, somebody who passed away in your family, you had a vision or a dream about him. That's that's probably what a lot of them meant by okay, he's risen. Yeah, he was he was in the grave, but uh, in your dream. In this other dimension, whatever that was in your dream or vision, he is alive or she was alive. So, okay, uh, okay. in that respect, in that respect, he's, he's, he was raised, but not necessarily here on Earth bodily. Okay, so you know it's kind of interesting hearing you talk because, um, you know, um, you're a Christian agnostic. So you know, people are trying to think like, well, he, obviously he's not a Christian. Well, he's a Christian agnostic. Well, he's not an agnostic either. So it's kind of yeah, you're a Christian agnostic. So you don't, I don't. I, I don't know anybody else like that who would ever, you know, say they're that. So it's kind of interesting hearing you talk and say this. Okay, so how about this? I suggest we go on to our third stage because um, basically we're out of time on this section here. I only got like into one-third of it. I um, hmm. didn't even get into the meat of it. What was the meat? Uh, <laughs> well, so basically the first thing was hmm. biological evolution we talked hmm. about yeah. and didn't get that resolved. And the second thing would have been neurology and what that says is that there, I would say there's no soul. And then I would have, then I would have said, well, you know, some people like Francis Collins, they say, okay, I accept, I fully accept modern science, but why can I still be a Christian? And so then I would have said, uh, let's let's look at the um, this philosophical concept called the problem of evil. So anyway, we don't have any time for that because what I'd like to do is ask you, let's let's go on to the third section here about uh, why aren't you an atheist or why do you think atheist is not a good position to be at? Why is why is your agnostic Christian a better position than atheism? Um, especially since you just said that you don't necessarily believe that Jesus died for your sins on the cross, and you don't necessarily believe he rose from the dead. So, so tell me why, why your position of a Christian atheist is better, or a Christian agnostic is better than being an uh, atheist? Okay, I think that either position, either uh, Christianity, depending on. How, how firmly you believe in it, and atheism were both very dogmatic positions to hold. And when you look at those, when you when you uh, are one of those or the other, it's hard to look at things in a in, a, in an objective fashion. So, 
I try to be very careful of what I can claim to believe and know unless I can actually uh, demonstrate it and prove it and discuss uh, what I know about it instead of just saying, well, these experts, uh, I believe this expert or that, that expert, is, which is really the reason and how a lot of people, and not just in religion, but everything, how we make our decisions based upon what we hear on the news, that which was first presented by an expert of some kind. So, so I try to be in about all these positions. So I, but like I said before, I had, to, I still have to make a leap of faith as far as how I'm gonna live my life. So if I'm an atheist, I'm gonna make every decision based upon uh, what atheism entails as far as ethics is concerned, and how I treat other people, and all that. So, um, so I decided to make the leap and uh, still hold to a lot of the values that I thought were important, which are based in Christianity. But I okay, also, well, intellectually, but intellectually, I also go ahead and, and I, I don't, uh, I, I'm, I'm willing to change my mind if I see new information. I'm not stuck, I'm not, uh, you know, stationed, uh, stuck in a position for life okay, based well, upon that. Yeah, you brought up a couple things, so let's talk about this a little bit. Okay, you just, you just summed up by saying that you're open to new information that if you if you saw for example atheism was true you would be a, uh, an atheist is that correct if i had absolute uh, information that uh, it was yeah but i mean that's a big step but okay so if you had overwhelming information that looked really convincing to you that atheism was true then you would accept atheism because it's true is that correct yeah i mean it have to be some pretty, pretty okay solid now evidence. now doesn't that contradict what you said earlier that um, you wouldn't want to be an atheist because then you'd be dogmatic. Well, yeah. I mean, if I knew, if I was at the point where I knew everything, at the to the point where I absolutely knew that was true, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't be make, I wouldn't be taking a guess. I would be, I would be based in my belief on knowledge at that point instead of, uh, you know, I mean, like right now, both of us, we have insufficient knowledge about everything in the world. Right. If I had enough well, well, nobody. Yeah, so, okay. well, I mean, that's not fair to say that, you know, if you knew for sure. I mean, nobody knows anything for sure, you know, to well, I know. That's, what, that's why I'm an agnostic, right. So, I mean, anything that you know that you believe about uh, atheism <laughs> could be uh, uh, proof wrong in the future. So, and, and you have to change your mind on something. Oh, so I mean, but, but no, hold on now. Now you're saying like, well, if you're not 100%, you have to be agnostic. Why Why can't you be an atheist if you have 99%? Do you, do you have 99%? Well, I, I have overwhelming. I would say to me it's it's kind of like um, you, you could ask any question. Like right now I'm looking in my computer. Am I 100% sure my computer's here? No, I can't say I'm 100% sure. Maybe I'm 99.999. This could be an optical illusion. I could be in a dream. There's all kinds of weird things. Oh yeah, that's, you're never you're yeah. never 100% about everything. No, that's that's something else. Though. Like, do am I right here right now? I mean, we we take that for granted as being truthful without getting into all those philosophical discussions about oh gee, am I am I really here or is it just an illusion or is it just a dream that we're all having and and. I'm just imagining that I'm here. Yeah, but we, the point we, is, okay. but, but the point is, though, you're saying you have to be 100. percent I'm saying you can't be 100 percent about anything. Well, okay, but okay, but uh, you know, it all depends on what type of uh, information I would have to convince me that atheism is true. I don't know what that would be. It would mm -hmm. probably take a lot. It would probably take a, a lot more information to uh, uh, prove to me that atheism is true than if I had enough information to prove that Christianity was true. That would be well, easier. Okay. Well, I, I still want to go back to your main point about that if you're an atheist, you said you'd be dogmatic and you want to be yeah. open-minded or something. Yeah. When I, when I was a Christian, I did discussions with other atheists, and one atheist told me, he goes, oh, Bernie, you're just so closed-minded, you know, you're just not open-minded. Mm. And so it's like, hey, well, you know, here I am an atheist now, so obviously I proved you wrong. So I, I believe that I am open-minded. I believe I am willing to accept the evidence where it leads. It's just that to me... It it looks like the obvious correct stance would be atheism. Okay, I don't I don't see how there's a conflict there with being open minded at all. Are you are you willing to change your mind though? Of course, yes. Okay. So, oh, I, I okay. I guess I guess it all depends at that point then. Um, <laughs> Uh, 
uh, I don't know, I, I, I assume it has to do with how you choose to live your life then in the future. Uh, for me, the Christianity is just basically, maybe it is a crutch for me. Maybe the music and all that stuff, and uh, it uh, gives me inspiration and it's me. So maybe I, I can consider that. Maybe you know, other people would consider that that's a crutch that I use. Okay, so be it. But um, I, I don't have I don't have a problem with that. It's just okay. Well, uh, I just I, I still, just want... but I but intellectually I still don't accept a lot of that information and, and all the beliefs about Christianity. But I still tentatively hold to it just in case it might be. Yeah, sure. And, uh, well, I just I just right. wanted to address your one point though that you're saying if if somebody's an atheist they're dogmatic, and I just want to say, do you agree that that's not correct? I mean, you could be an atheist and, well, I mean, it depends on what you mean by dogmatic. I mean, open-minded. <laughs> I mean, no. I don't care if you call me dogmatic, but don't call me. No. Don't say I'm not open-minded because, I mean, to me, dogmatic just means you have principles. It just means you have certain basic foundational beliefs. I mean, that doesn't bother me at all. But to say I'm not open-minded, that's that's something different because that's an intellectual stance that I believe I am open-minded. Okay, I wouldn't. Okay, maybe you're a, a unique example. I think uh, usually atheism. When somebody says they're an atheist, it, it usually means that they disbelieve in God. They don't believe in God. An agnostic usually means I don't know, and I don't know if anybody, if it's possible to know. Right. So, uh, uh, so I mean, just. For me personally, that's uh, a better. I tried to be an atheist. I was in there for for in and out a little bit once in a while, and I and I didn't really like it at all, because <laughs> uh, it really affected a lot of the way I, I approached uh, a lot of decisions in life. Because in contrast with what I was raised as, uh, I just uh, you know I felt like I I didn't feel like why help anybody because this is all going to end pretty soon. Uh, why uh, why even say a prayer for anybody? Because you know it doesn't. Yeah. It's not going to mean anything anyway. So I mean, and I, you know, and if it does mean anything, even if it doesn't mean anything, and it, and it and atheism is true, it still gives me, and I think other people meaning to think that they, you know, if they do pray, that something might good happen. I have a lot of things that I've written down. I don't. Uh, I have them on my computer, but there are all kinds of coincidences and uh, answers answers to prayer, and and uh, these things. Uh, I don't know what to make of them, but I have to at least. That's why I consider myself a Christian because of those those experiences I've had. So I can't well, just dismiss well, those. Listen, I can't no, just dismiss those. So I yeah, and that, again, that's why I call myself a Christian agnostic. I still have doubts about it, but I still have to hang on and uh, and uh, you know maybe see see if I can eventually make it work if it is true or whatever. So. Well, let me tell you how you could. Okay, first off, um, have you heard of a philosophy called existentialism? Mm -hmm. Do you know what it is? The Soren Kierkegaard is the father of that movement, or is that right? That's just basically, I know there's a lot of different meanings that people use for yeah. existentialism. It's just the meaning of life and trying to survive and based upon uh, various what, things. What, what, think. Would you think are, what do you think are some basic principles of existentialism? I'm not really sure what, what I would consider any... Uh, Basic beliefs. Do you, if you're, if you studied up on that, you maybe might be able to tell me a few things. Yes. Yeah, see, it, see that's that's the thing. See, most people do not know very much about philosophy. I mean, for example, I have a four-year college degree in uh, electrical engineering, and I didn't have one class in philosophy. So, all my philosophy is self-taught, basically. And um, for example, existentialism is a really good philosophy about how to live your life. And you know, you know, but people don't know that, but they are familiar with Christianity. So when you leave, leave Christianity, they're kind of like rudderless and don't know what to do, because I think personally the atheists have not done a good job of showing a replacement and saying, "Hey, let's talk about philosophy." I mean, for example, when you talk about ethics, you know, these are the Christian ethics. Well, if I'm not a Christian, what are my ethics? People don't really know that, but ethics in philosophy is a very rich discussion. So. Mm. Um, anyway, I but the only the only difference between uh, the fact that it is a, it is it is a rich discussion, uh, it still implies without a, a moral lawgiver that uh, anybody else's opinion is just as good as anybody else's. But I don't I don't go as far as what a lot of Christians will say about that. I think that uh, I used to have arguments that I used to make when I was an atheist against that, and I still. Uh, I believe that there's some truth in there. I don't believe in the arguments that Christians use about well, you can, if you don't believe in uh, absolute moral values, you can't absolutely can, uh, 
con uh, condone what Hitler did, or not condone what he did, because um, that's just uh, he was just uh, living in his period of time and his mm -hmm. culture, and and you can't really say anything about. It. I don't agree, I don't agree with when Christians say that. I don't think that okay. we can get into that right now, but right, um, right. I'm not well, saying by, that, but. well, by the way, Kurt, um, we're out of time right now. We need to finish up. Let me give you okay. like, can you give like a thirty seconds uh, closing summary? Okay. Uh, from, well, I mean, what? You know, like, there's a Robert time to do a closing. We're already finished here? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought we were going to go maybe in an hour. Uh, yeah, possibly. but I mean, uh, we had a late start, and um, my just the way I have everything set up here, I have to sign okay. off now. So. Okay. Okay. That's so just kind of, why, don't you, why don't you just give a summary, and then um, okay. I'll, I'll give a little summary. Okay. I, I consider myself a Christian, but here's a few things that I, I was going to uh, raise about why... I definitely don't believe in a lot of things that the Bible says here. Uh, here's a, I don't know if you're familiar with that chapter in Genesis, I think it's Genesis 20. Lot's wife, or uh, yeah, Lot's daughters, getting them drunk yes. and having sex with them. Okay, that seems a little off. I, uh, I've, I've been through that uh, verse several times, and it just seems really, really off. Uh, I've been drunk many times in the past. I've never came home and... and uh, well, there's much thought, worse oh stuff my, than... Oh, my God. I, uh, my, sister, my sister looks really good, and, and I think some of these things are so ridiculous that I can't really take everything at face value, but I still have to take the fact that uh, I think that the moral law in the Bible... Uh, if you compare it to all the other moral laws in the in the world, that uh, through all the other countries, it says one of the first one that really started giving rights to people like slaves and and uh, women, and not maybe not perfectly at the time, but uh, it was certainly better than the other uh, countries and religions have. So I, I I have to hold on to it a little bit, and uh, like I said, I don't I don't necessarily take uh, the Bible as literal as a lot of people do. There's a lot of gray areas in there. Uh, but it doesn't bother me because I'm not uh, trying to, you know, make a, a living or a ministry off, off of dogmatism where people can send me their money so I can live a you know, rich life like Hank Andercraft and John Hagee. So, uh, that's in a nutshell, basically, I guess, why, why I would consider myself uh, a Christian agnostic. I had a lot of other things I was going to get to here. I didn't know how the conversation was going to go. Yeah. Uh, I was going to go through my deconversion process, but uh, I guess we we'll, might have to do it at another time. Okay, yeah, we might uh, talk again, um, yeah, on some of these topics. Uh, you know, yeah, maybe a certain topic. Um, but when it comes to morals, I want to say, like, uh, in my booklet here I was talking about, I, I wrote a little chapter about the problem of evil, and I even give some stories about how God could be shown to be a moral monster, and the problem that you listed, the moral issues you listed, they're actually quite tame to some of the, you know, the things I wrote about. I think. I mean, there's there's a lot worse than that. So. Uh, oh, the one in Genesis. Oh yeah, yeah. Of yeah. course. I mean, I was just so, using that as a really silly example. I think that was just uh, thrown in the Bible. Uh, I don't know who. I think the religious leaders probably uh, got somebody pregnant and they blamed it on the women and said they got him drunk or something. I don't know, but. Okay, so Kurt, well, uh, it the other way around, but uh, yeah. that's the way I see it. I don't know. Okay, well, thanks for uh, thanks for being there. Uh, thanks for doing this uh, discussion with me. I think it's important to show that people can talk about these things because in our society, atheists and Christians don't really talk. They they like to demonize each other. So uh, I appreciate your uh, time to, for discussion. And yeah, I think we will talk again, maybe on a certain topic. Uh, it sounds interesting. I think. Okay. So, great. Okay, with that, we'll end the broadcast. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Bye. Hey, thanks, Bernie.